and welcome to the first episode of A Writer's History of Science Fiction, where I interview science fiction authors about their personal take on their chosen genre. The usual Reader's History will be back in two weeks. I'm Alex Howe, and with me today is Max Hawthorne. Max has been called the Prince of Paleo Fiction. His books Kronos Rising and Kraken have featured on Amazon bestseller lists such as Sci-Fi Adventures and Sea Stories, and he is also the author of the recent children's book, I Want a Tyrannosaurus for Christmas. Hello, Max. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. We're putting up with me. <laughs> so to start off, uh, just tell the readers what your writing is all about. The Kronos Rising series. Okay, so um, there are a series of sci-fi thrillers. Um, it all started with the first novel, Cronus Rising, which I originally wrote way back in 2004. Then I got hitched and you know, had a child and all that stuff. And, you know, those things kind of get in the way. So there was a big delay there between that when it was published and 10 years later or something. But uh, there are sci-fi suspense thrillers. The first book was set up under the precept of what might happen if an enormous prehistoric marine predator, something extinct, as they say, um, somehow was let loose into today's seas and exploring, of course, the impact that a predator like that would have on the ecology of the oceans, related food webs, etc. Um, I'm a bit of a conservationist, so if you think about it, I mean, sharks have been wiped out by the millions. Whales, still, some of them are 5 or 10% of the original population. So if you set something loose like this, some sort of huge apex predator into the oceans, and it was managing to start to breed, let's say, you have nothing to keep it in check. So the whole threat behind it wasn't just, oh, there's this giant jaws-like creature on the loose, et cetera. It's what will happen if this creature isn't stopped. Will we reap the, quote, rewards of how we've exploited our own oceans? And it just sort of grew from there and evolved into a huge series. All right. So obviously having a prehistoric marine predator is why it's considered paleo fiction. Uh, but more broadly, what would you say defines paleo fiction, especially since the book is set in the present day? Well, paleo fiction has become sort of an evolved genre of, uh, I don't want to say horror, but of uh, sci fi thrillers, et cetera. I mean, Jurassic Park, for example, by Michael Crichton and his books, obviously, in The Lost World, would be considered paleo fiction. The idea being not that it has to take place in prehistoric times per se but that you have something from the past that is now in the present and obviously is the inevitable threat that posed by its presence, its existence, et cetera. It could be something that was frozen in ice. I mean, I mean that's been done to death a million times, cloning, et cetera, things mm -hmm. of that nature. But uh, it's, 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 I think it has a lot more appeal. I mean, well, I'll, I'll interject. In my first novel, I did flashback scenes to the Cretaceous which sort of set things up without doing an info dump early on. So I actually give readers uh, a direct view into life of the Cretaceous and the actual meteor impact that wiped out the non-avian dinosaurs. But I think the appeal of paleo fiction is that it's, uh, it seems like it's more likely to happen than stories about zombies or werewolves or things of that nature, especially with the advances in cloning. I mean, they're planning uh, to bring back a lot of the Ice Age megafauna now from Siberia, mammoths mm -hmm. and cave lions, and who knows what will be roaming around soon. So, you know, <laughs> I think the real trick that was achieving a, in your writing and your story is achieving a suspension of disbelief that makes it, because, you know, it's been done before. So you really have to have an angle and uh, the right skill to put it out there to the reader so that it's believable, where they're like reading this and like, I'm not going in the water after that. You know, <laughs> and I've been blessed to hear that from people. You know, trying to take down the uh, swimming trunks industry single-handedly. <laughs> All right. And do you have any scientific background in this area, or are you self-taught? Uh, well, it's kind of interesting. Um, my dad was a rock hound, meaning that somebody who collects fossils and minerals and things of that nature. He had a jewelry store. So as a kid, I grew up with <laughs> mammoth skeletons in the house and giant shark's teeth and dinosaur eggs and all sorts of stuff. So, you know, I was fascinated with it at a young age. And I guess I was always into science. You know, I had my prehistoric scenes models kits, which are 
before your time, I'm sure. It was an old, you know, we're going way back. But uh, I, uh, when I was in college, I was always in the science. I worked at the uh, Cabinet of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia for four years. And um, even though my major was in film and animation in college, I took every science course they had there, whether it was anatomy, kinesiology, human origins was a great one. So the, the studying, though, comes with the writing. And I have actually evolved into a what I call an amateur paleontologist, since I don't do it mm. professionally. But my first formal scientific paper, which solved the mystery of plesiosaur locomotion, um, came out last year. Well, no, unless you're in 2019 now, we're obviously not in 2020. Mm, yeah. And I worked on that with two paleontologists, which was Dr. Mark McMenamin from Mount Holyo College and Paul De La Salle from the UK. So I put together a team, you know, because it was all new to me and you want people on there accredited so that people don't think you're some sort of wacko. But I actually came out with a theory that a common sense theory that no paleontologist ever figured out that explains why those four flippered marine reptiles were able to swim so well and how. That's interesting. I'll have to look into that at, uh, later. Yeah, if you go on like Wikipedia and look up Plesiosauria, you'll see there's a few mentions of me on there. There's an animation mm. from the paper that came out, things of that nature. All right. So you grew up with this stuff, but mm. what inspired you to write science fiction? Or maybe I should say what inspired you to write fiction about prehistoric marine reptiles? Well, once again, we can blame my dad for some of this. Um, you know, Star Trek was out when I was a toddler, the original Star Trek. Mm. So I watched that. I was terrified by some of it. Oh, the Gorn was so scary and stuff. Mm. But um, now you look back, you're like, what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think sci-fi is more exciting than the monotony of everyday life. I mean, if you take the train to work versus you take a, a speeder from Star Wars, you know what I mean? It's it's that that's the influence there is inevitable. But um, I think the prehistoric sea creature thing came from a combination of the fact of me being into things of that nature, but also I'm a avid angler, even a world record holder with the IGFA. So mm -hmm. I've been on the water, gosh, thousands of times probably at this point. But uh, going on hundreds of deep sea charters, seen some crazy stuff, caught some crazy stuff. And so, so you put that two together. I mean, marine life is a scary thing. If mm -hmm. you, you know, Jaws, for example. I mean, that opening scene in Jaws where the, the poor girl gets killed in the beginning when her boyfriend's passed that drunk. You know, thinking about it, on land, human beings are, we're not exactly formidable. I mean, think about it, really. Mm -hmm. We have no fangs. We have no talons. A chimpanzee our size is five times our strength. So we're really, like, kind of helpless on land. You put us in the water. I mean, even a world champion swimmer swims just a couple miles an hour versus fish and dolphins and whales and orcas and things like that. You know, they're speed demons. So you're in the water and you're just struggling to stay afloat. God forbid it's even dark. Something comes up under you. You can't see it. You don't know what's there. It's a terrifying prospect. So put that all together with something that's even more dangerous from times past. And it's a really exciting genre to work in. Yeah. I have a similar story about Star Trek The Next Generation mm. and then going out stargazing. And that, that's a big part of how I became an astrophysicist. Excellent. You know, I actually saw a UFO one time while doing that. Really? I swear to God. Crazy. It was 30, 31 years ago. But I don't want to bore your listeners with that stuff. <laughs> but it was really something to see. I talk a lot about the history of the genre in this show and a lot of it is tracing how earlier works have influenced later ones. So one big question I want to ask is who or what would you say was the biggest influence in your writing? Well, when I was an early adolescent, 12, 13, 14 years old, I read a lot of works by Edgar Rice Burroughs and Robert E. Howard. Um, so books like Conan, Tarzan, things like that, their writing styles, you know, my writing style has some influence. You can see it from both of those authors. Um, mine's a little more, I don't want to say modern, but evolved in a different direction. Um, and also Stan Lee and Marvel Comics, mm -hmm. believe it or not. Uh, I mean, people think that's crazy, but Marvel taught us how people could do, not just how people could do or be anything they wanted, but how you could take it 
like excitement and almost like exaggerate it, but not be stereotypical. And if you can have exciting parts to your plots and cliffhangers, things like that, you put all that together and that's where I, I guess, where I came from, where the biggest influences are. So here's to you, Stan. All right. You said you published your first book in 2004. Mm-hmm. How did that come Actually, about? I'm sorry. No, no, no. I wrote the first one in 2004. Ah. It didn't come out until 2014. Ah. At all. And originally, there was the first book that was published was actually in 2013, which was called Memoirs of a Gym Rat. Well, what, what happened with me is before I got decided, oh, I'm going to be a full time author, I'm going to write novels, things like that. I used to be an outdoors person, fisherman, et cetera. I used to do a lot of like little pieces and submissions for a lot of outdoor magazines. So I, I've had stuff in everything from outdoor life to in fishermen to I even had a, a nice piece in, um, what's it called? I think it's Saltwater Sportsman, which actually helped save the life of 400 Goliath Grouper. They were going to do a, you know, kill 400 fish just for a, a, a scientific experiment for their age. And it wasn't necessary to do that. You know, so I, I wrote a very impassioned piece that was in there about that. But I was doing a lot of this on the side there. And then I started getting into, you know, figuring out how to write a novel. Believe it or not, I had to teach myself how to write novels. Because mm-hmm. even though I had AP English in college, et cetera, there wasn't any formal class on it. Yeah. You know, so you can't just say, oh, I'm going to write a novel and think you know what you're doing because you don't. See, Mm -hmm. so I said, okay, well, let's be logical about this. I'm going to do it as if I was in college. So I went out and I bought like six textbooks on novel writing, read them, digested them, practiced what they preached, did homework, gave myself homework assignments, et cetera. And then I put it all together until I, you know, came up with my first manuscript, which took a year because it was like almost a 200,000 word book. I'd say nine months of writing and it was three months where I had surgery and I was, you know, laid up or whatever and stuff. But, um, and then what happened was, uh, I ended up doing the traditional looking for an agent thing and Mm -hmm. I made the terminal mistake of signing with the first agent that said, I want to represent you. You know, she was Mm -hmm. a neophyte as it turned out. She had worked in the industry, um, from the other end, worked for major publishers negotiating contracts from their side. So a big author would come in and with his people and his agent, and she was part of the team that finagled what they were going to give the author, et cetera. And so I think, I believe this was a money thing. She saw these huge checks and she thought, I want to get my 15% of that. So she started doing this full time. She snatched me up. But the problem was she, like I said, she was a neophyte. And she didn't know what she was doing. Mm-hmm. The first, like she started, she made horrible mistakes. The first mistake was she never read my manuscript. Ooh. Can you imagine? Like she might have read like the first couple pages or chapter, if that. What she did was she gave my manuscript to a guy she was dating who was a contractor. <laughs> a contractor. Now, there's nothing wrong with contractors, there's readers, et cetera. But you don't give a contractor a manuscript and then send it to the editor in chief of you know, different publishers, mm-hmm. et cetera. I think that his opinion, I mean, he stayed up until all night reading it because he thought it was great. But as a, everybody's first book always has problems and mine did too. And there were too many plot lines. It was a little convoluted, things of that nature. You know, it was like all over the map kind of thing, see? And so she started sending this manuscript based on her boyfriend's opinion to big publishers who knew her and they were happy to look at it. And she burned bridges for me. You know, because they were like, well, there's problems here. Probably, you know, you could see from their responses and stuff. And then another writer she represented told me, oh, she didn't even read it. And I was like, wow. So I, I got rid of her and I revamped the book and went through a whole bunch of stages of redoing the book, et cetera. And then I partnered up with these guys um, from an indie house called Far From The Street Press, who they knew I was going to do a book about the fitness industry because while I was doing a lot of the stuff, I was working full-time managing health clubs. You know, I was doing writing and all this other stuff. And I saw so many nightmares, things going on behind the scenes there. I wanted to warn people about it, so I did a tell-all, see? Mm-hmm. And these guys were all excited about this. They figured, we're going to ride this to the bestseller list and all this stuff. So they wanted me to, you know, that's, that's how I ended up with them. But that book ran into some problems. Cronus Rising was a hit for them. So, and I, you know, that's more my passion, not talking about catching people, 
doing things they shouldn't be doing in closets together and gyms is not as exciting for me as <laughs> writing about yeah writing about marine <laughs> reptiles the size of a whale sinking boats i, I prefer the latter so yeah. there's a long answer that, that, that's good i'm also self-taught with writing i didn't go and formally read any textbooks i just kind of winged it but you know i have drafts of three novels that will never see the light of day because that's how long it took me to actually get anywhere close to good at it yeah but you have to go back now and look at those books and say okay do i have a passion for any or all these stories and now that i know what i know can i take these the bones of these stories and turn them into something really good uh, and, and i am doing that one of them i'm uh, recycling a lot of the material into uh, a new project and another one I, I might come back to eventually. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised. I mean, some stuff, I mean, some stuff you think and you're like, what was I thinking back then? Mm -hmm. You know, but, and then some stuff though, you find like hidden treasures or the portions of it. It doesn't have to be the whole thing. You know, even if it's set, set pieces, scenes, et cetera, characters, you know, nothing mm -hmm. is, nothing is necessarily dead and buried. So what is your writing process when you're actually creating a novel? Well, the first thing is that usually when I do a book, I have the general story already in mind before I can get started. And I know this is going to make me sound like a lunatic, but a lot of my writing I do in my sleep. Hmm. It's like I, I vividly dream sometimes an entire book or a good portion thereof, characters, action scenes, dialogue, technology, all sorts of stuff. It's like I have something that talks to me in my sleep and is telling me ideas. And then what you're going to do is you're going to have this guy and he's going to really be this guy. You know what I mean? It's like, like, and I wake up and I literally, I keep my phone next to my bed and I will sit up in the middle of the night and I'm like texting myself plot scenes, ideas. Sometimes there's so much of it that I'll get up at three or four in the morning and I'm like, oh, and I just come downstairs, go into my office, turn on the computer, and I just write up a whole synopsis and then go back to bed or try to. But when it comes to the actual physical writing, I mean, I think I'm pretty standard. I have an outline of the book. Mm -hmm. I have an outline of the chapter. I know my character arcs, cliffhangers, things of that nature, conclusion. If I'm running multiple plot lines, which I'm known to do. You know, how I'm going to bounce back and forth between those guys, etc. You know, that's a Terry Brooks taught me that. You know, sort of Shannara mm -hmm. and all those books. Great writer. He's somebody I also look up to and emulate. Well, no, I, I don't think it's crazy because uh, one of my books did come to me in a dream. Mm -hmm. It's crazy, right? No, I mean, but it's like, like it's almost like there's somebody in your head who's like. Mm -hmm. da, da, da. Pulling the strings, you know. I think it's Hemingway. He's out to get me. Could be. One or two of my books, I didn't see in a dream, but they just kind of came to me like that. Mm -hmm. And I could see the whole story start to finish, and it was more a matter of, you know, working out what I saw to write it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you could see it in your head, I'm just telling what readers say. If you look at, like, my reviews, a lot of times they rave about how they feel like when they read my books, they're watching a movie. They can see it in their head. And my background as an artist originally, you know, I was an animator and film and stuff like that. I can draw, paint, sculpt, you name it, I can do it. Mm -hmm. I just don't. It's just not a career thing for me. But and sometimes I'll do like a drawing or a sketch for something. So it's like that ability to put things on paper with your hands, with a brush, with a pen, et cetera loans itself to just transcribing that or transforming it from the visual into the written. You're just creating the visual for the reader using words now. And what you see, if they can see what you see when through your words, then you've done your job. I can agree with a lot of that. I definitely see things in cinematic terms when I'm writing. You have to. If you can't see it, how's your reader going to see it? All right. So if you can choose... Which of your books did you most enjoy writing? I think the, I mean, I was obviously very passionate about the first novel. You don't write 193,000 words and then redo it multiple times if you're not mm -hmm. passionate about the story. But I think the mm -hmm. books that I enjoyed writing the most 
were the last two Cronus Rising Kraken novels. And that ended up being a trilogy. Originally, it was supposed to be just one book. Mm -hmm. But I had been coming up with ideas for it back in 04 when I finished the first novel. And for the better part of a decade, I kept coming up with ideas, scenes, dialogue, all this stuff. And I kept a huge file. So 10 years later, when I said, oh, i got to write a sequel to Cronus Rising now because they want it. Now, I thought I was going to be able to do a 500-page book, but it turned out to be a 1,600-page book. So we had to break it up into three separate novels that are all connected. I mean, they can't physically print a book that size, it seems. So I enjoyed the last two the most. Um, it let me branch out. I got to move away from doing just oceanic stuff, bigger, more complex set pieces. There's this you know, secret base hidden inside the core of a, an offshore mountain. There's the, the characters, the technology. There's a... A, an, an island involved with prehistoric life on it. I was able to just do so much more stuff. And I was so familiar and comfortable with the characters. It's like an old friend. You're just really just turning up the, you know, mm -hmm. the heat on them. And the readers like them. I mean, the reviews have been highest for the last two books in terms of like the average rating and stuff. But, you know, they're all like, oh, Max's best book yet. We want more. When's the next book? <laughs> You're like, oh, why don't you go out and write 600 pages then? Tell me how easy it is. When's the next book? It's horrible. Stalkers, emails, texts. Mm. When's the book? Oh, uh, Thanksgiving. Meanwhile, I hadn't even started it yet. <laughs> <laughs> I lied to so many people about the book, the release dates and stuff like that. It was terrible. Oh, I shouldn't be saying that right now. Oh, well, I'm sure they figured it out. All right. Well, I, I'm not going to ask you about your next book, but uh, can I ask more generally what's next for you? Um. Well, I'm kind of juggling two projects, or I'm about to. The first is a couple years ago, I wrote a, a screenplay, um, a horror screenplay, which is, I don't know why I decided to do it as a screenplay instead of a book. I think I it was easier and all that, but I, I'm going to turn that into a novel. No, usually it's the opposite. You know, mm -hmm. the book comes out and then the script, that type of thing. But since I haven't sold the screenplay yet, I'm going to do the book put the book out and then sell the screenplay on its heels, I guess you'd say. So that, and I'm doing another Cronus Rising book and I'm going to be keep doing some songwriting on the side because believe it or not, that book, my kid's book, I want to try and source for Christmas. I actually wrote a children's song, Christmas song that came out this, you know, a month ago called a Tyrannosaurus for Christmas. Hmm. It was, did very well. The YouTube videos are really racking it up and stuff. And it's an adorable song and all that. So, yeah, you have this creative side. Poetry is songwriting. I don't write mm -hmm. the music. I have people that work for me to do that. But, you know, so I'm just, I'm all over the map, I guess. I don't know what I'm doing. Never mind. It's just a lot. I know the feeling. So this is a question that I ask everyone who comes on the show. Of course, you're, you're the first one. Mm -hmm. uh, but as sort of a poll, what do you consider to be the first science fiction novel? I would say... Homer's The Odyssey. Really? Yes. I Which I was forced to read when I was 10. <laughs> 10! Let me say that again. And the Iliad, too. 10! Mm -hmm. What kind of parent does that to the child? Yes, because, I mean, it's more like the Ray Harry House and stuff, if you think about mm -hmm. it. You know, sword sorcery, but it's also science fiction, honestly. I mean, the Cyclops, Skill and Charybdis, all that stuff. That's my opinion. Yeah. I, I've I've not heard that one before. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, if you're thinking more I, Isaac Asimov and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, uh, I have heard Epic of Gilgamesh as the first one. Mm -hmm. I can see that. I mean, the Theseus story would be definitely be the first horror novel mm -hmm. or novella, something like that. You know, the whole monster in the house thing. You're yeah. trapped. You know, this thing is out to get you. You're trying to get out alive. All that stuff, but. Yeah, I mean, to me, I think that the Odyssey is to, is, is the first science fiction book. But it'd be more like, uh, I don't think you'd call that hard science fiction, but, well, I mean, if Ray Harryhausen's works are, are science fiction, then I would think the Odyssey was also. I, I think the division's usually, you know, where do you draw the line between sci-fi and fantasy? But mm -hmm. there's there's definitely a point of view that they were the same thing before the Industrial Revolution. Well, we're going back thousands of years, obviously, yeah. with Homer and stuff. So, yeah, it's you know, it's just a personal thing. But maybe it's because I was 10 years old and 
you know, had to read all this. Oh my God. It was like, and the writing style, I, I don't think I could read it now. I don't know how yeah. I did it then. Yeah. I, I had to read it in high school and I don't think I got the best translation. Yeah. I won't make my daughter go through that. The other question I ask everyone is, do you have any must reads in sci-fi that people might not have heard of? I'm going to go by what I read, like when I was uh, 10, 12, 14, something like that. But uh, I would say, first off, I think it's called Bug Wars or The Bug Wars by uh, an author named Robert Lynn Absprin or Asprin, Asprin. I might be pronouncing it wrong. Um, mm -hmm. As but uh, it was, I think it was probably inspired by Star Wars, but it was a story about a race of reptilian extraterrestrials that were, it had nothing to do with Earth, that were engaged in an ongoing genocide of war against e enormous and intelligent insects. Um, so probably the inspiration for Starship Troopers at some point, or at least on some level. But uh, it's called Bug Wars. Robert uh, Lynn Absprin. I found it. The Bug Wars by Robert Asprin, 1979. So after Starship Troopers, but does sound like an awful lot like a possible inspiration for Ender's Game. Yeah, I think it was probably inspired a bit by Star Wars. Obviously, just the name, The Bug Wars, that type of thing. Um, I remember the cover having a lot of stars on it and insects flying around that look like fighter planes or something like that. Mm -hmm. There's another book I really enjoyed, which um, was much more of an epic, I thought, by Sterling Lanier called Hero's Journey. I think that was from the early 70s. It was, I remember it being a big book, and it was sort of like a post-apocalyptic mm -hmm. story um, that took place on Earth in Canada or something. Life had been mutated by radiation who knows what um and uh it was it was a, an impressive tale these psychic sort of clerics they used to they ride rode mooses into battle but they called them a morse instead of a moose which i thought was a nice turn uh there was telepathic bears there was all sorts of stuff but it was a big and and lanier is probably best known for being the editor that published dune that mm. fought to get dune published but then he became a novelist himself Pass away before you do the third book in Hero's Journey. But I enjoyed it immensely. People would like it, I think. And finally, what advice do you have for aspiring writers? First thing is, I mean, it, being a writer, especially getting into the field, is very tough. So, I mean, I have a shoebox in my basement of overly photocopied rejection letters from agents that I used to query. Seriously. I mean, like, like there must be, like, 80 or 90 of these things in there mm. and 95 percent of them maybe 99 percent of them are these photocopies that you can see have been copied and recopied and recopied so many times they're not even the original that you can't even they're barely legible it's like an <laughs> insult to your intelligence and your dignity that you put all this stuff together and you send out these this beautiful query to these people and you know they're not even reading your stuff you know, there's some minion in a mailroom somewhere whose job is just to stuff these things back into the envelope that you gave them and you paid for self adjusting envelope, okay, <laughs> with a reform rejection letter to crush your dream. It, it can be very disheartening, you know. So, my advice would be first, you got to grow a very thick skin, okay. If you can't handle rejection, you're going to have to be incredibly lucky or incredibly connected to get into writing. But I will say something that I've told writer, a few writers or spy writers on social media in the past. And it's very simple. It's you never give up, never quit. Other people can stop you temporarily. You're the only one that can do that permanently. So hang in there. All right. Good advice. Thanks again for coming on the show. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much for putting up with, I mean, for having me. And sorry for rambling so much. No, it's it's why, good. Maybe uh, it's why the books are so This was a good warm. conversation. Oh, thank you. Thank you for listening to A Writer's History of Science Fiction. This interview will be a part of the regular Reader's History of Science Fiction playlist, available pretty much anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you want to see more of my work, including some short fiction, you can visit my website, sciencemeetsfiction.com. 
and Max's website can be found at chronosrising.com. The next episode, we'll be back to our regularly scheduled reader's history, with the first of a trio of episodes discussing the disaster and apocalyptic stories that became popular in the new wave. Interestingly, starting with the most fantastical ideas for the end of the world. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.